You may be seated. It is so uh, wonderful to see so many of you here this morning uh, with the women's retreat and 19 of our women uh, uh, are gone uh, for the weekend on this retreat. I wasn't sure we had anybody in here this morning, but I see we have a good crowd here, and, and I, I can report back to the women that their husbands did indeed show up for mass, even though they were away. Uh, this morning, I, I, before I begin to share with you a reflection upon today's readings, and what the Holy Spirit has to say to us today, I did want to uh, acknowledge we have here for the very first time their first day in church, um, <clears throat> a young child who was just born into the world, uh, and uh, I would like for uh, you to meet uh, for the very first time, uh, Malachi Caputo, would you like, uh, the son of, of Michael and Marion, oh, you can stand up again, we didn't get much of a look there, okay, that, that, that. Our, our church now is one person bigger than it was before, and uh, we'll be celebrating uh, Malachi's uh, baptism uh, uh, in two weeks uh, on a Sunday morning. So we look forward to sharing that joyful moment with you, Michael and Marion. And then also um, we have some, uh, some people who have returned after a long absence. It's great to see the moments. And how come you're sitting in the wrong place? <laughs> Uh, someone took your seat. Uh, that's what happens when you come to mass late, you know? <laughs> but Dylan, Patrick, great to have you back. And uh, are you, Does that mean you're all done with school? And you're, 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 you're finished. Yeah. Okay, good. And you're going on to seminary to become a priest, right? <laughs> is that the plan? <laughs> i got to retire someday. i got to persuade one of you. <laughs> if today... Oh... I should say before I begin, I want to introduce you to this priest that's up here behind me, Father David Gerardo. And Father David uh, is from our community up in Olympia, Washington, uh, the, the Emmaus community of the ECC. And he's down here with his wife, Judith. And Judith, if you could stand up, we want to welcome to you. with us um, uh, this morning, praying with us. If today you hear his voice, writes the psalmist, harden not your heart. That is from Psalm 95. And uh, every morning, uh, it shows up in the morning prayer of the, uh, the liturgy of the hour. So uh, those who have been engaged in religious life or as a priest will remember, uh, because we were required to pray that psalm every day, if today you hear his voice, harden not your heart. What a way to begin your day. Because the, the troubles and the difficulties and the challenges of life, our hearts tend to become hardened, don't they? We harden our hearts because to have a soft heart is to be vulnerable and to risk being wounded. And how often our hearts have been wounded. So there is the tendency to harden our hearts. But the psalmist reminds us, if today you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. If you have a hard heart, if you become a hard-hearted person, you will be not able to hear the gentle voice of God's Spirit whispering in the depths of your soul. God is speaking all the time. God is there and God is not silent. And the reason we do not hear God quite often is because we have allowed our hearts to become hardened. So harden not your hearts because God is speaking to you. He's speaking to you here at this very moment in this sacred space. For we're in, in the place of mystery, where heaven and earth has met. And in the depths of our souls, God is whispering and speaking to you. So do not harden your heart. 
My brothers and sisters, I was having a conversation earlier this morning with one of the members of our community who attends the 8, 8, 8 o'clock mass, uh, a good friend of Hans, uh, Guy. Some of you know Guy. And, um, and so in the course of the conversation, it, it somehow came up um, the statement of Jesus that you're all too familiar with. It's the statement where Jesus um, says to Thomas, his disciple at the Last Supper, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Now, we have heard that scripture passage so many times in the past. It's familiar to you, isn't it? That's the problem with those of us who have grown up as Christians. We have heard these words of Jesus so many times that our hearts have grown hardened to them. We become jaded. You know the saying, familiarity breeds contempt. You hear something over and over again, and it just is a formula that we have memorized and tucked away in our minds, and somehow we, uh, the meaning of what Jesus is saying eludes us. Oftentimes, Christians would use this verse, or I would say abuse this verse, by using it as a way of saying, see, I'm in the right religion, and you're not. You know, it says right here, I am the way and the truth and the life. Not comprehending at all the depths of the meaning that Jesus is attaching to those words. For he was Jewish and he was speaking to a Jewish audience. And when he used those three terms to describe who he is, the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus was conveying something of very deep importance and meaning to his disciples. For to the Jews, the highest values of all of life is to know the way. The Torah is often referred to as the way. This is rooted in their national experience as the people of Israel because they were always people on the move. They were delivered out of slavery in Egypt and wandered in the wilderness. And they didn't know the way. But God was the way for them. They just followed the pillar of cloud or fire. And God was the way who led them through the wilderness to their final destination in the promised land. So the, one of the highest values for someone who's Jewish is to use the word the way. That meant something relational with the God who delivered them from their bondage and leads them into the land of promise. And to follow Torah is to follow God. It is to follow the way. And the truth? Well, when Jewish people speak of the truth, they're not thinking of some sort of abstract philosophical concept that we can somehow comprehend with great intellectual discipline. That's not what they mean by the truth. For the Jews, truth is a relational concept. It means faithfulness. For the Jews, God is the way. For the Jews, God is always faithful. So truthfulness for someone who is Jewish meant faithfulness and the life. With the Jewish people, life is always relational. Where there is no other in your life, you are dead. Life is being in relationship and ultimately in relationship with that being who called you into existence. And so for a Jewish person, when Jesus was saying, I am the way and the truth and the life, he was identifying himself with the highest values of the Jewish religion, with divinity itself. The divine life is the way, the truth and the life. And I am the embodiment of that life of God in your midst. Isn't that astonishing to you? But St. Paul went to be an apostle to the Greeks, a different culture, who had different values, a different religious uh, tradition, who had invented philosophical thought because they had the language that could bear such abstract concepts. It is the culture of Aristotle, Plato, and so many other of the great philosophers. We think of the Greeks, and they're more closely related to us than the Jews. We often see the Greek civilization as being the beginning of Western civilization, of which we are the heirs. And the Greeks also had their trilogy of, of their highest values, which they would equate with divinity. But it was different than that of the Jews. For the Greeks, the highest values, uh, which can be expressed as being divine values, is the good, the true, and the beautiful. 
For the Greeks, what is true is that which corresponds to the reason that is a part of the mindset of humanity, the ability to reason and to think and to ask questions and to seek after wisdom. That is the true. And they identified that true ultimately with that ultimate being which is divine, which we call God. And when they talked about the beautiful, don't you love that? The Greeks understood that all the beauty that we observe in the world is but a dim reflection of that which is truly beautiful and the source of all beauty. And doesn't beauty delight us? There's a young couple here getting ready to get married. And I'm sure that Chris looks upon the beauty of his bride. <laughs> Beauty. It is something about beauty that attracts us. That's why we love art and music. And we see it in nature. And so the Greeks identify that the ultimate value also is the beautiful. And all the things of beauty we see around us, the objects of beauty, all bear witness to that which is the ultimate beautiful. The beautiful one, the divine life. And then finally the Greek, Greek said, and the good. Ultimately, the divine life has nothing to do with evil. Evil corrupts. Evil lacks something. Evil is a parasite. But the good, all that is good and beneficial, is to ultimately derives from that one who is divine. And so when Jesus said to the Jews, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he was saying, I am the living fulfillment of all of the aspirations of the ancient religion of Moses, of Judaism, of the Jewish people, and the nation of Israel. When Jesus was portrayed by Paul as being the good, the beautiful, and the true, he was fulfilling all of the aspirations and this desire and the striving of Greek civilization. There was a Methodist theologian by the name of E. Stanley Jones. I'm looking at you, Michael. <laughs> Michael was a Methodist. And uh, E. Stanley Jones uh, was a missionary to India in the 20th century, and he became very good friends with Mahatma Gandhi. E. Stanley Jones was an American missionary and theologian over there in India. And the question that always occupied his mind, how can I make Christ known to the people of India? How can Christ become Indian for the Indian people? They have a different tradition. They are Hindus, a different religion, a different way of thinking. And so when he would say, as many missionaries would say, Jesus is the way and the truth and the life, they did not comprehend the meaning of that. It did not speak to them. And then when he used, as so many missionaries did before, the Greek ideas that influenced Western civilization, that Jesus is the, the true and the beautiful and the good, they did not quite understand that concept. It didn't fit in to their experience. And so this theologian thought, what are the three highest ideals of Hindu religion? And then he came up with this. When Jesus said he was the way, the truth, and the life, he was saying also to the Hindus, I am karma, I am bhakti, I am jhana. And when he said those three things, the people of India understood that because those are the highest values. When he say, I am karma, I am the way of justice. I am bhakti. I am the way of loving devotion. I am yana. I am the way of wisdom. And so when these things are said, we realize that Jesus is not only the fulfillment of the aspirations of Judaism. He is not only the fulfillment of the aspirations of the Greeks. He is not only the fulfillment of the aspirations of the Hindus. Jesus is the fulfillment of every religious value of every religion and culture of the whole world. Jesus is the universal Christ, and he fulfills all human religion, no matter what that may be, or what truths they hold on to. Ultimately, Jesus is the fulfillment of all of religion and philosophy. In fact, he is the fulfillment of our humanity. That is why Jesus, when he is preached, is so indescribably attractive to us, to everyone. When you know Jesus, and you know his story and the narrative of the gospel, and when you hear the gospel, it is difficult to resist. 
there is an innate attraction to the one we call the Son of God. Isn't that powerful? You see, the gospel, my brothers and sisters, is all about Jesus, and it always was. If you're preaching Jesus and proclaiming Jesus, and I don't mean just by words, but by your life, you're proclaiming the gospel. If you're proclaiming the gospel, you're proclaiming Jesus. If you're not proclaiming Jesus, you are not proclaiming the gospel. You can be very religious and talk all about all kinds of religion. But you're not talking about Jesus. It's not the gospel. It's just your religious ideas. So oftentimes Christians forget to preach Jesus and we start preaching morality. As if morality is an end in itself. If it, the Christian life is all about obeying rules, that's a subtle kind of idolatry. It's a legalism that sets in. And then we want to put the burden of our legalistic religion on those who can't keep it. And we're like the Pharisees. We put heavy burdens on people and we don't lift a finger to help them. That's what Jesus said. The gospel is all about being in relationship with Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God. But, my brothers and sisters, it costs us something to be a disciple of Jesus. There is a cost to discipleship. Paul knew this well. In the second reading, he is writing a letter to a man by the name of Philemon. Now, he writes this letter. It's a personal letter, and whenever we read it, which is once every three years on this Sunday, I feel like we're listening to someone reading someone else's mail. Did you get that sense? This is personal correspondence between the Apostle Paul and Philemon, who was a wealthy man who lived some miles away from where Paul was staying at this time. Uh, I always think it's uh, rather interesting to read this letter. How did it ever end up in the New Testament? I don't think Paul could ever imagine that this personal letter that he sent to Philemon was going to be read 20 centuries later in a church in Southern California. He probably didn't even know Southern California existed at that time. Isn't that something? Here we are, we reverently listen to these scripture and these words, and I think that Paul had no idea that it would become sacred to us. And yet we gain an insight, great wisdom and truth that comes from this simple little letter that ends up in the canon of the New Testament. You see, Paul was a prisoner in Rome at this time. He was in chains in the city of Rome awaiting trial. We know the ultimate outcome of that. He would sacrifice his life for the sake of the gospel. He would be martyred. But while he's there languishing in prison, Paul did what he always did. He proclaimed the gospel. He couldn't stop himself. He couldn't help himself. He had to talk about Jesus all the time. And he was leading all the prisoners to faith in Jesus Christ. And so Paul would be rejoicing even though he was in chains. Paul knew the cost of following Jesus. To follow Jesus meant to give up everything for Paul. It meant even languishing in a dungeon somewhere in Rome. And while he was there, he was there not alone. Timothy was with him. Luke, the physician, was with him. But then there was another young man, a very young man that was in the cell with Paul who had, was a new prisoner uh, put in there with him. And Paul took advantage of the opportunity. He had a captive audience. <laughs> he preached the gospel to this young man whose name was Onesimus. And Onesimus came to believe in the message of Jesus and embraced the faith of Jesus. He believed the gospel. And so Paul was catechizing him there in the prison cell, getting him ready for confirmation. I say that because I'll be teaching confirmation following that to the young people that are here this morning. Getting him ready, teaching him. But the thing about Onesimus is that Onesimus was a runaway slave. He was owned by a, name, by a man named Philemon. Now, Onesimus escaped from Philemon, and he traveled all the way across the Mediterranean, some 1,000 miles, to Italy, and ended up in Rome because you can lose yourself in the crowd. Uh, Philemon lived in a place called Colossae. Colossae is about 90 miles uh, east of uh, Ephesus, which was on the coast of Asia Minor, where it's today Turkey. And, um, and so Paul, who's there and converts Onesimus, finds out Onesimus' story, that he's a runaway slave. Now, this was a slave economy. 80% of the population of the Roman Empire were slaves. The whole economy depended upon slavery. And there was a penalty for being a runaway slave. If the owner decided to put you to death, 
He legally had the power to kill you for being a runaway slave. It's the way they control the economy of that time. And so this runaway slave ends up with uh, being a companion of Paul. So Paul happens to know who the master is. He happens to know. It's a Phil Philemon. And Philemon is a new believer. In fact, Philemon has a church there in Colossae. The church meets in his house. So Paul sends a letter to Philemon. He says, I'm writing to you because I have this young man who was your slave but is now my son. And I have begotten him in the faith, and now I restore him to you as a brother. I'm sending him back to you. But I want you to receive him as you would receive me. And if he's caused you any cost, let it be billed to my account. I will cover all costs. I'm asking you to do this as a friend. I could insist on this and demand it of you because of my authority as apostle. But I ask you as a friend to do this favor for me. And don't forget, you owe me your very life. And I want you to prepare a room for me because I'm going to check up on you. In the meantime, I'm sending Onesimus the slave back to you. But now he is your brother and treat him as such. Wow. Uh, we don't have the reply of Philemon. <laughs> but I'll tell you this. Onesimus, in the next generation, becomes the bishop of the largest church in Christendom. He becomes the bishop of the church in Ephesus after the apostles pass from the scene. So God had plans for this little slave youth who would someday become the bishop of the largest church in the ancient world in his time. We don't know what Philemon did when Onesimus returned, but apparently Paul's letter had an effect and we preserved it for centuries to read there. You see, there was a cost for Paul to be a disciple of Jesus. He gave up everything and was now in prison because of the preaching of the gospel. There was a price for Onesimus. Onesimus had to be, pay a price to follow Jesus. He had to go back to his slave master. It cost him to be a follower of Jesus. He could have stayed there in Rome, but instead Paul sends him back at great risk to his life. And there was a cost to Philemon because Philemon would be required to forgive Onesimus and receive him as a brother. My brothers and sisters, we talk about the salvation of God as being free, and it is free. Our great salvation has been given to us by a generous and extravagant God who loves us so much that he took the greatest treasure of heaven and sent it to earth. That is Jesus of Nazareth. He did this out of the Father's loving heart. God did this because God is in love with humanity and would not abandon us and would do everything to restore us back into right relationship with himself. This is the essence of the gospel, that God is love and that he will spare nothing to bring us what we call grace. Salvation is free, is it not? I just have to believe these few things and I get into heaven. I get fire insurance for eternity and now I can get back to the real business of living. I took care of that religious problem in my life. Well, it may be true that grace is free for you, but it's costly grace. And it costs to be a disciple of Jesus. Jesus says in this gospel very startling and difficult words. He says, unless you hate your father, unless you hate your mother, Unless you hate your wife, or your husband, or your spouse, if you, unless you hate your children, and your home, and your job, and unless you hate even your very self, you cannot be my disciple. Shocking words. Jesus does not come along offering us a comfortable religion, my brothers and sisters. The religion of Jesus is the religion of uncomfortability. It's an uncomfortable religion. If you're feeling satisfied and comfortable sitting in a church, listening to the gospel of Jesus, you're not hearing the gospel. But if you're getting uncomfortable and your conscience is starting to trouble you, then you are hearing the voice of God. If you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Jesus says, you have to love me more than everything else. You have to give it all up. You even have to give up your own self. 
here we come to the heart of the matter. As long as I'm living for number one, as long as I'm pursuing my self-interest, as long as I'm looking out for myself, as long as I'm doing that, then I'm following the ego, the false self. And that self that is all tied up with selfishness and egotism and narcissism, that part of you is a false thing and it must die. It must take up its cross, its implement of death, and follow Jesus. It must die with Christ at the cross so that it may be raised to a new life. And then when you're raised to a new life, you have mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers, and you have everything more than you can count. If you hold on to your self-interest and upon your life, you will lose it. But if you give it up for Christ, you will gain it back and you will get more houses and brothers and sisters and, and mothers and fathers than you can even handle. That is the life that Christ is calling us to. It's cost something to follow Jesus. You know why? Because he just doesn't want part of you. He wants all of you. Jesus wants everything. We're called to give up everything for him and to follow after him. If today you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Amen. Let us stand and profess our faith <clears throat> using the Nicene Creed.